two of our charity stream for the Center for Suicide Awareness. I am the person behind the curtain, Hallie. I'm just here. Um, <laughs> observing, watching, running the stream for these lovely, lovely people you see on your screen. And they will have a chance to introduce themselves here in just a few. I'm gonna do our little housekeeping bit here very quickly. Yes, this is a charity stream. You heard me correctly. This is day two. So the Center for Suicide Awareness was our community voted on charity um, that we wanted to work for this time around as our final stream for 2020. They are a US-based organization, but they work with international groups, uh, providing resources, training, and crisis assistance for people in need. They have a text line. You can go to their website, centerforsuicideawareness.org, for all of the information. Um, they're really wonderful. We're super pleased that we're able to help out and spread awareness and hopefully raise a little bit of money. There's a live ticker that you see on your screen to the right. We've already raised $100 of our $500 goal, so thank you for everyone who has donated so far. You can go to the custom URL right below that live donation ticker, tinyurl.com slash terribleparty-oct20, and that will take you right to the donation page. And again, um, this is for the Center for Suicide Awareness. They're doing really amazing, valuable, needed work, particularly in a dumpster fire year that has been awful for everyone. Um, so definitely go check them out and lend them support if you can. We would really appreciate it. Uh, we have this stream at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I'm going to be joining Nate from the DM's Test Kitchen Chef's Night podcast, along with our friends Kelly and Mandy. Mandy, you know, from Slam Manners. And we're going to be watching him play Amnesia and scaring the crap out of ourselves. <laughs> And me screaming. <laughs> so that's how that one works. Um, our 4 p.m. stream unfortunately got canceled. I am a little ill today. So instead, some folks are going to be streaming some Among Us and doing some backstabbing just for funsies. And then at 8 p.m. tonight, our very own Harl Chaotic, a.k.a. Kiwi from our Pathfinder game, Emerald Endings, the Thomas is in, is going to be running some Urban Shadows at 8 p.m. Eastern. So that will be fun. Um, we can't wait to see all of these games. I am talked out. I'm going to let James take over. James, you lovely person, you. Thank you for doing this, good sir. I super appreciate it. And everyone, have a wonderful time. I can't wait to sit here and hear the stories. All right. Morning, everybody. Are you all sitting comfortably? You've joined us for our Campfire Story Special. Everybody will be introducing themselves shortly. But just so you know what you're getting into, we're all going to be telling a spooky tale legend story whatever you want to call it um so be prepared for maybe some occasional spooky moments i mean as far as i'm aware we do have some little trigger warnings up underneath our faces so you know roughly what you're going to be getting into for the story because we all enjoy a little bit of a scare but we don't want to you know do anything too bad um i'm james i'm a writer from england you'll have seen me in various charity games i mean i was on last night um with sam we're in spirit fairer I'm going to be in Among Us later, and I've been here for a couple of years now. It's always been my pleasure. And I've also got a Kids on Bikes one slash two shot coming up on my channel very soon. But that's enough about me. I will let our guests introduce themselves. Uh, good morning to those on the East Coast. My name's Michelle C. Light. The C does stand for Crystal, and I'm sus, which means that I'm like storytelling uber stories that's what sus means Quite clear. <laughs> um you may know me as the storyteller of boston by night on the onyx path twitch channel which ha is airing its special episode tonight actually at eight o'clock eastern standard time with a special guest uh melee damage uh you might also know me as playing the beehived uh uh, she, uh, Iris, on Deep Magic, which airs on Fridays on Archives of the Dragon. I don't know how I'm going to follow that up. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> like, just, oh, wow. Um, so, yeah, hi, I'm Thomas. You've probably seen me on this channel. Uh, obviously, if you watched yesterday, you would have seen me playing Glass which I had a lot of fun doing. If you watch every Wednesday, though, you would see me playing uh, 
Haley, sorry, Helena. Oh, I'm dropping secrets there. Helena, the uh, human sorceress in our Pathfinder game. Ooh. And uh, yeah, woo. <laughs> I um, am panic internally because I made a lot of mistakes today and I don't know how to handle it. So we'll see how today goes for me. That's the real five. horror story. <laughs> yes. Just tell us about your day. That is the real horror story. <laughs> oh, so that's the thing. I haven't had a day. I've just been an idiot. It's, it's all, fine. You're doing fine. wonderful. Um, Wholesome content before we start I'm scaring right the pants of everybody. <laughs> putting the Twitch chat up on so I can read what you guys are thinking right now. As well. Uh, spooky time, spooky time, spooky time. So, you know who we are, and I guess it's time for us to get on with the show. I'm going to take host privileges. I'll tell my tale first, and then we will move around as happy as Larry. So, everybody's heard a story about Bloody Mary. Her tales are some of the more famous stories about Catrophancy, however you pronounce it, Google wouldn't tell me this morning, <laughs> which is the practice of mirror divination. Her name has been lent to many other icons as well. DC, Marvel, they both have characters that share the name. There's a nano tyrannosaurus skeleton called Bloody Mary. Queen Mary the First famously held the moniker for her efforts to establish the Catholic Church. And of course, there's the alcoholic cocktail, which we're all familiar with quite clearly. But we're going to focus firmly on supernatural tales today, as I take you through the various tellings of a story, as well as my own encounter with a spirit. The origins of a legend come from a ritual that was said to reveal the secrets of a lady's future. If a maiden was to walk backwards up the stairs in the dark, holding a candle and a hand mirror, as they stared into the mirror, there may be a chance they'd view their future suitor's face. There was, however, a teeny tiny chance that they'd view the spectre of death instead, appearing as a stark white skull floating behind them, indicating they'd die before they had a chance to marry. This got twisted over the years, as a lot of oral storytellings do, um, into the act of summoning the spirit of Bloody Mary by chanting her name in the mirror. Sometimes it's three times, sometimes it's 13, sometimes you just have to keep going and going until she turns up. But, um, what she does when she arrives also tends to vary. There's a few tell us that say she's a friendly ghost, but in most she's a little bit more scary and malevolent. The corpse of a lady will appear in a mirror. She'll scream, she'll strangle, she'll make you bleed. She may even steal your soul. Yet still people choose to summon it, and it's treated lightly enough that some people even call it the mirror game, as if summoning spirits could be called a game. Actually, talk about that. It bears a lot of parallels to the urban legends surrounding a spirit called Hanako-san. Hailing from Japan, the ghost of a young girl is said to haunt school bathrooms all over the country. Supposedly she died within, either killed with a parent, during an air raid during World War II, or even a stranger sneaking in. Again, this one is very much a aura tale, so it depends which version of a tale you're hearing. Appearances also vary. But most common one is a small girl wearing a red skirt or dress with a little bob haircut. The method of summoning always remains the same, though. You knock on, you enter the girl's bathroom, you locate the third stall, and you knock three times before asking if Hanako san is there. If you're lucky, slash unlucky, um, you'll receive an answer of, yes, I am. And at this point, the store door will open. And you'll see either a hand or a full body apparition of the girl herself, who will occasionally just float there, stand there, or even pull you straight down the toilet and into the bowels of hell. But yeah, I know, wild, right? <laughs> but my story's a little bit different. It involves no mirrors, no bathrooms, not even a candle or looking for my future husband's face. It just involves me and Bloody Mary. I was a fresh-faced teenager at the time in a small English village in the middle of nowhere. Before this night, I'd never even heard the tales of Bloody Mary. It's not really a legend that goes around here. I mean, we occasionally get the Grim, the Big Black Dog, um, or just generic ghost tales, but our urban legends are normally more about the little old lady down the street that'll kidnap you. Or, you know, never go down that corner because somebody will stab you in the middle of the night. You know, much more grounded, realistic tales. But this story 
what happened that night is what put me down the research rabbit hole that brought me and this story to you today. I opened my eyes, frozen in bed, with a winter chill hanging in the air around me. For whatever reason, I felt that I needed to get up. I just needed to get out and wander about the house. So I stood up, opened my door, and wandered around until I ended up in my parents' bedroom, staring out into the window, just out into the street in front of my house. That was when I saw a strange figure looming there. She was walking along the road, with long, ratty black hair, a white dress hanging from her body, stained mostly red with fresh blood. From her right sleeve, you couldn't see a hand, instead some form of metal implement hung there, either a hook or a blade, rusted and dulled with time, but clearly still very dangerous. As I was staring at the thing, whatever she was, two words surfaced in my mind, a name I'd never heard before, but I knew with absolute certainty belonged to this creature, Bloody Mary. The second the name settled on my mind, and I became aware of what was going on. The creature looked at me and vanished without a trace. And then I woke up. The last thing I remember was the, her empty sockets staring into my eyes, and I was there in bed, lying down, awoken from a dream. Or so I thought. As I lay there with my eyes closed, not moving, just trying to grasp back into reality, I heard the sound of breathing rasping at the end of my bed. I tried to keep my eyes closed, but they weren't listening to me. They began to open themselves slowly revealing the scene before me. There she was, standing there. Her eye sockets were no longer empty, instead filled with bloodshot, well, eyes, I guess, <laughs> staring intently at me. Her arms lifted slowly, lifting that metal monstrosity into my sight line as I was stuck, paralysed with fear. She held it aloft, but what seemed like an age, just standing there, watching, waiting. And then she struck. There was pain, so much pain. She slashed at my chest, stabbed into my stomach. She left me mincemeat from her waist down, effectively. All I could do was watch and stare while she worked, begging in my mind to wake up again, just to wake up wake up and as i felt myself slip out of a dream and back into what i hoped was reality all i could remember was the shape of the wounds on my chest the pattern which they made and i woke up for real this time covered in a cold layer of sweat just sat there shivering again i didn't want to open my eyes again i couldn't hear the breathing but it didn't mean she wasn't there Eventually, I calmed down. The sun rose. Reality and asserted itself as terror leaked away. And I opened my eyes. I really wish I hadn't. I bit my tongue to stop myself from screaming. From the neck down, I was covered in bruises. Long one, long thin ones, circular ones, in the exact same pattern as a wound she'd left of a dream before. They faded quickly from my body, but the memory, that lasts to this day. And yeah, tale of Bloody Mary. <laughs> I didn't expect that part, though. I... I got... That was... Oh my goodness. <laughs> also, the thing that scared me the most was you were telling about this horrific thing, and then the door behind Tom is slow. I know that's my dog. Oh, I, I knew the minute he like, came in. What the? F I knew the minute he came in, he was going to cause trouble, and oh. I hope that worked. <laughs> I, be, I just rereading the chat now because I was getting slightly into it. And uh, Brad, you had an exploding baby with your bloody Mary. Ex what? What? I'd like, I'd like a bloody Mary hold the exploding baby, please. That is. Absolutely mental. But yeah. <laughs> uh, as as someone who loves as loves uh, psychological horror stories like that, 
um, you might be interested in something called Corpse Party, which ha is its own Bloody Mary type situation yes. with a girl yeah, named yeah. Sachiko. Oh, I would like it. And a this. paper doll. It's a visual novel that uh, it's also an anime series. Ah, that'll be where I recognized it before. Um, I've heard the name back to that. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know which one it is. Mm -hmm. uh, me and my friends actually made one of the paper dolls and we did it together in college. Why? I dressed up as her for Halloween. I was a huge fan. Amazing. I scared the shit out of her. That seems like <laughs> such a bad idea. Only if you don't understand the difference between death and love. Because <laughs> the, um, Shiawase can mean happiness. She awase can mean death. Oh. Same word. Depends if you put a space in between. <laughs> that is needlessly confusing. Amazing, but... Languages <laughs> are weird. Yeah. All right. Anyway, does that mean it's my turn? Feels great. Yeah. My a story is part history lesson, part real tale. So... I grew up in the Berkshires, which is a mountain range in I'm breathing soggy, Western Massachusetts, bordering on New, uh, bordering on Vermont and New York and Connecticut. The year was uh, this was the early 1800s, and a uh, plan was put into place to drill a t to put a tunnel through the mountain system to go from Massachusetts to New York to transport goods quicker. This was going to be the biggest tunnel of its time. The Hoosick Tunnel, some people also pronounce it Hoosack, like Isaac, um, or Hoosick, like with the word sick at the end. All of these are acceptable. The government put down two million dollars at the time, which is a lot of money for the 1800s. The true horror of the fact is that they spent $21 million on this project to, be to make the longest tunnel of its time. However, this tunnel didn't come without its sacrifices and earned itself the name The Bloody Pit. The year... Do -do -do. I have my notes. Because the project actually began in 1851, and it was finished in 1875. It, this project took over 20 years. Um, <laughs> um, however, the uh, disaster. There are multiple disasters over the years. The worst one actually happened in 1867. Uh, everyone during this time, it, the project had been halfway completed. Uh, everyone was like, this thing is a waste of time, a waste of money. Why on earth are we doing this? Uh, but it was already halfway done. Uh, so many people had decided to just leave. Those people were smart. Supreme Court ju uh, justices were like, this is the worst project ever. Like, this is so boring. Why are we making this tunnel? Um, the mill owners were like, please keep building this tunnel. Please, we need to get our transport over. <laughs> However, workers gave it the name the Bloody Pit. In this 4.7 mile long tunnel, they decided to use the tools of their time, which included things like dynamite. It included picks. Some even only had their bare hands to use, but this was a day's worth of pay. One day, they were testing out this new type of explosive, a nitroglycerin. Three men went down here to test off this explosive. Only one came back. The other two had tragically died when the explosives were set off early. They were set off prematurely. Now, a, a lot of people chalked this up to just 
a mistake. This was the first time they were using this. This, there was no way that like, no anyone could have predicted this. But people in town, this guy had a grudge against those two. Some people say that he set it off on purpose. Early. This was the casualties that occurred all throughout this excavation of the tunnel, but this was the first time anyone ever thought, could this have been murder? But work goes on. We bury the dead. Huzik is the word meaning stones or rocks, and there were plenty of gravestones to be found regarding these workers. And as they continued to work, one day, as the snow fell around them, officers were patrolling around the areas and had found a body. They had found the body of the man who set off the explosives, Ringo Kelly. Ringo Kelly's body was found in the snow, right where he originally set off those explosives. And as police looked at him, they saw these ghastly marks on his neck, on his arms, as if he had been dragged and choked with long, engaging fingernails into his neck. And as they look around the snow, they saw their own footprints behind them. They saw the footprints of this man. But they did not see signs of a struggle. They did not see any other set of footprints in the snow. They only saw this one man who looked like he had been fighting. But the snow told a different story, which led the locals to believe that there were ghosts, that the specters of the people he murdered had rose from their stones, had rose from the hoosick, and slowly suffocated him. Science on the other hand, wants to believe that this was a simple matter of the gases from the tunnel. Some people wanted to believe that one of the sources of these explosions was the natural gas. But even if he did suffocate from natural gas, nothing, nothing could explain the claw marks in his neck, the drag marks from his arms being pulled in different directions. Nothing could explain this, but it remained unsolved. More and more people lost their lives to complete that tunnel. There were many instances of explosions that were completely avoidable had people taken the right precautions. But they were playing with new mining technology. And then, October 17th, 1867, this is what was known as the longest day in the Hoosick Tunnel. Just after noon, 13 men descended into the tunnel's central shaft. They were tunneling from both ends of the mountains to try to meet in the middle. They wanted to finally get this tunnel completed. This was going to be the perfect ending to this story. They had a building on top of the shaft. It contained the materials that they used for this tunnel. It contained their oil to have their lamps shine through the darkness. The explosives used for blasting. The gasoline, they tried actually, like, doing lines of gasoline. I know that, sound, that sounds horrible now that I say lines of gasoline, but I'm sorry, I'm getting emotional. 
they had tried using lines of gasoline to light up the tunnels, hoping that it, a continuous flame could be done. Um, however, one day, a single spark occurred in that building, filled with the oil, the dynamite, the nitroglycerin, the gasoline, all of that in one tiny building. And flames roared through the tunnels. It, the building had no chance to survive. The four men who were inside the building at the time had to evacuate, but they didn't let the 13 people in the mine shaft know what was going on. They thought, we, if we put this out, if we put this out, everything's going to be okay. If we put this out, everything's going to be okay. And they fought this fire. They fought the raging inferno of negligence, of putting all of this flammable stuff in one tunnel. But as soon as they tried, the building started to collapse around them. They, men, were showered below in the tunnels with flaming balls of material, like... Those of you who play D&D would understand this was probably a ninth level fireball going at them. Flames and materials, wooden just planks of doom rained down upon these men from above as they were struggling to try to escape the tunnel systems. As they tried to extinguish the flames from above and the men tried to escape from below, Eventually the flames died, and the smoke permeated through the air. A man named Thomas, Thomas Mallory, was lowered into the central shaft trying to look for survivors, but he knew it might be a one-way trip. He wrote out his will before going down. He went down and started looking for survivors, and he had a rope tied to him where if he needed to get out he would pull on it as hard as he could and as he started to explore the mine shaft looking for these survivors he started to uh, feel something his head started to feel light his vision started to go blurry and he could swear that he saw specters down in the tunnels. His breathing became ragged as he was trying to continue to find people. He had hope. He only had hope as he continued to try to breathe. Eventually he knew he couldn't take it anymore and he pulled on that rope as hard as he could. He awoke a few days later up on the surface in bed. His wife, standing by his side, didn't know if he was ever going to wake up. He survived the incident and was able to tell the story of seeing the specters down in the tunnels. When the workers eventually found an underground ravine of sorts because the pump stopped working, there was no way to get that water out of the pumps. It took them a year to finally find where those 13 men were. And it turns out those 13 men were found in the bottom of this shaft. And they had constructed a raft to float on the underground lake. But when they found those 13 men, they all had marks on their neck. Marks that could not be explained. Some believe that the spirits of those who were murdered had caused the death of these 13 men after the explosion. More and more sightings of ghosts occurred throughout the years up to the completion of this tunnel. A cavalry officer, Paul Travers, went to examine the tunnels because someone heard a man's voice cry out in agony. This is a, a cavalry officer. This man had seen war, and he hadn't been frightened since the day of battle. He wrote, eventually wrote down in his journals. 
Villagers would told, tell stories of vague shapes and whales near the pit. Uh, they saw apparitions of lost miners carrying picks and shovels through the mist and snow on the mountains. And they say that after the workers' bodies were found, the apparitions vanished, but they kept hearing the moans and screams. A hunter named Frank Webster vanished near the tunnels lately, and when the search party found him, they found him dead, cold in the snow, with a face of pure shock and terror and those marks on his neck again. Things that science could not explain, not even the science of now. Some people believe that it was just gases, natural gases that caused people to hallucinate, but this was an entire village above ground. And to this day, nobody knows. A lot of modern day ghost hunters go down there now trying to uncover if this place really is cursed. If the bloody pit deserves its name. The project was completed. There is still, you can still visit the Hoosick Tunnel today. And you can still visit the different historical monuments. The Engineering Society has actually named it a great engineering feat of its time. And it wasn't for many, many years later where a longer tunnel was constructed. And But no tunnel shares such a rich, terrible story. Such as the bloody pit. I, I'm, yeah. <laughs> you just as lost for words as I am. Yeah, so no, I've been, I was ready to, you know, just, just listen to a spooky little story and chat in the chat, and we have, all of us have been reduced to absolute silence. I'm so sorry. <laughs> that oh, that's is amazing. <laughs> come on, that's a, yeah, like, jeez. I have and, to like, follow that up. <laughs> you can still visit the site and visit and like view the journal entries of these people who were there. Oh no, 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 no! I need a road trip. Uh, the Berkshires have a lot of historical buildings. A lot, and this is where I grew up. I grew up in the Berkshire Mountains. I, you, I. Like, used to go to school in the historical schools that were built in the 1800s. Wow. Why? Why would you? I wouldn't know. Just, um, just know. And so, yeah. Um, my own my own brother actually do, used to do ghost hunting um, with, uh, in the local inn where that Ghost Hunters TV show actually showed up once at one point. I got to meet them. Oh, see, that's cool. Um, and they were investigating the uh, one of the local inns. I was literally right down the street from where I lived. Nice. And uh, there's a reason why all my friends are too scared to drive there, but I don't live there anymore. So. Yeah, no doubt. Like, no, I would not ever want to go near that place. No. I've been in like an old um, like. English main and first of all, people back then were tiny. Right. I mean that I'm like six free. I go in yeah. those things and I literally have to leave because it's too short for me. <laughs> I can't yeah. go down. <laughs> like yes. the one rule we were told when we went and, and entered that main was remember this particular high beam because everyone bought bangs their head on it as they enter and leave. And we're like, Oh yeah, cool. So all of us crouch down, go in, and as we're leaving, I think all three, me, my brother, and my friend all just went clunk as we left. <laughs> Because we just um, totally forgot, and like, no, just. Mm. So yeah, the um the bloody pit incident actually happened March twentieth, eighteen sixty five, and the other two men were Ned Brinkman and Billy Nash. Ringo Kelly, which is the worst name to have to tell a spooky story about. Mate, yeah. you managed it. I was sat there. I was like, Ringo Kelly, this is gonna be hilarious. No. Nope. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I was like, oh, sweet Ringo. Yeah. Um, they were like. They try. They really tried to figure out who killed Ringo Kelly, and nobody could figure it out. And like the snow, there were no other sets of footprints at all. Not even animals. See, my first thought was obviously because you said they tried, to, you know, science and whatever. But obviously, science in the eighteen hundreds isn't like great. No, 
And even so, modern day science, they're trying to figure out like, was there some sort of a hallucinogenic gas? In the that's world? my first thought. It has to be like there had to be in some sort of pocket of something, right? Like but nobody's found anything. But I don't. I feel my first again. My thought is like it has to be something that is like that doesn't stay around long enough to but, you know, just. Mm. I love the fact that they all have a mark on the neck. I love a good ghost saying, story like, that has a trademark. It's like, yeah, we always put the marks on the neck. Let's go. Because <laughs> that, like, to me, you know, mm-hmm. yeah, it seems like someone, like, clawing at their throat because of, like, mm-hmm. something there. So it's like... Ugh. Darling yeah, Thomas, it's... we're not here for your science tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I have to. Science! <laughs> It's it's one of it's one of like my my one of the favorite tales that I have of the of the area and uh, driving through the Berkshires at night, especially with the small mountain towns. Beautiful, but scary. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, because a lot I... of the old roads, they the we don't like you when you go to the Berkshires. You have two options: you can cut through the mountain, like you can go up and over, which has a lot of twists and turns, or you can go around the mountain. I always recommend to my friends, if you're going to go visit me, take exit th- take exit two off the turnpike and not exit three. That way then you can avoid all the spooky mountain roads. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, boy. Again, I have to follow that up. I'm sorry. You're going why, to do fine. Gonna, gonna go why, why are you so good at this? emotional. Yeah, well, come on. Why are you so good at this? <laughs> Quickly, while she's gone. <laughs> I, I, what do I do? <laughs> anyway, <laughs> like, how do I follow that up? Oh boy! Yeah. <laughs> you did so well, and I ah, uh, goddamn. Well, I don't think my story is going to be as really as chilling. That really, that really did actually kind of. I didn't think it would, but that really got to me. But um, my story uh, does have something, I guess, close to my heart and, or even close to, uh, I guess, the profession. And you two would probably feel it as well. It involves around uh, writer's block and um, the the sort of lengths that someone would go to try and get rid of it and try and especially someone uh someone has a who's has a quite a prolific career as a writer my story uh starts in the 80s and uh follows a man named dave uh, dave marigold he was actually quite a prolific writer back then um he wrote a best-selling series of children's books known as Henry the Hump, following a small little hippo for his misadventures. He actually wrote 12 of these books, and like I said, did very well. But after writing 12 books, it's obviously not easy to come up with more. And it got to a point where Dave's publicist insisted that he uh, take some time off and rent a cabin out in a small village up in the mountains called Miner's Creek. This town is almost forgotten by time. It is isolated in the woods, let's say with the, their mountain behind them, where their mine get where they get their name sick. Nothing but a general store, a gas station, and odd houses spattered around. So of course it is very bleak very simplistic in fact in dave's own words it's rustic it's simple getting away from the hustle and bustle of all the of all modern technologies was actually quite easy even in the 80s no tv very little radio very easy to not have any distractions dave eventually makes it to his lodgings a small little area with three or four cabins that he knew he'd be renting uh, from an old lady by the name of Miss Miss Cartwright. As he arrives, 
he enters into the main office and just like the village outside sees something that you can only describe as just almost forgotten a hard and hand carved desk at the back of the room an old gaslight lantern used to light i guess any late night writings and the looming presence of a giant stuffed bear welcoming him to the room. He, just as he's exploring the room, he is welcomed by a voice behind him, a sweet, almost doting voice. Hello, dear, you must be Mr. Marigold. As Dave turns, he sees the silvery haired woman and replies, ah, Miss Cartwright. Uh, yes, she asks, how long would he be staying? And he mentions a couple of weeks, as long as he can to get this story, get rid of this writer's block. She gives him a key to room 209. For some reason, our cabins are numbered with vastly large numbers. Dave asks, why is your your cabin seem to go to at least 300 but i only see four and miss cartwright replies um oh well it would appear that i lose a lot of keys so i always make new ones and just renumber the cabins dave finds this confu finds this odd but doesn't question it he goes to his cabin 209 puts the key in the lock, creaks open the door, and inside the room is adorned with a mass of cobwebs, indicating that no one has been here in quite some time. Miss Cartwright apologizes for the mess, but Dave says it's fine. Again, it has that rustic feel. So it again, it almost has that otherworldly, out-of-the-way feel that he's looking for. Dave enters, sets himself up, puts all his clothes away, brings out his father's old typewriter that he used to write every single one of Henry's books. Sets it down on the desk and waits. Hours pass and for lack of a better term, Dave has done nothing but sit and stare at the typewriter, hoping that even just the initial presence of where he is would give him some sort of inspiration, some sort of spark, but nothing. Nothing comes. He looks out the window and sees the quiet forest Nary a bird tweet, howl of a wolf, nothing. Dead silence. Sort of chuckles to himself and realizes that he's almost been completely whisked away to somewhere different, somewhere unknown. But he dismisses it and goes to bed. He doesn't sleep long, however. For, as, for he's awoken suddenly by a loud knocking at his door. Just a bang, bang, bang. He, he jerks awake, not going to the door, but he shouts to it, Miss Cartwright, is that you? Is there something wrong? He gets no reply. He holds for a moment. Miss Cartwright? Nothing. He goes, he's just about to go back into slumber when again the banging appears, but this time it's louder and faster. It's bang, 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 bang. He jerks awake again, rushing to the door, unlatching and unlocking it, swinging it open to realize that there's nothing. No cabin. No Miss Cartwright, 
no town, no forest. Instead, before him is nothing but darkness and silence. Dave is hor horrified by this sight, almost shock white. He calls out to the emptied black, but gets no reply. As he is about to close the door and try and hide from this nightmare, like get away from the strangeness, the door seems to fight back against him. As he pushes and struggles, he realizes it's not the door itself that's struggling against him, but the actual darkness itself. The darkness is actually pushing against his door and is trying to break into his room, trying to break in. Eventually, he can't hold it back. It forces its way into his room. He tries to scream and tries to run to whatever space he has, but he can't. All he gets is grabbed by whatever shadow this is. It pulls him across the ground. It starts to then engulf him. But not from the outside. First, it engulfs him from the inside. Dave screams, but he can't. Nothing escapes his, voice, his mouth. When suddenly, he jerks awake. He looks around. Seems to be some sort of bad dream, bad nightmare that he had. You can hear birds tweeting outside. He can see lights off in the distance as the town, as whatever the tiny sleepy village gets to work, waking up for the day. He has breakfast and asks Mrs. Cartwright, Mrs. Cartwright, you said you make these keys because you, the numbers, you always lose them. Why do you lose the keys to the, these uh, lodges? And she replies, Oh, well, that's, well, that's um, an odd question. They just disappear. People come and they stay, but they don't stay for long. They seem to just vanish into the night. Almost everything vanishes, then the clothes, the... everything. Dave is surprised, of course, and shocked. He asks her, do you not report these missing people? Do you not call anyone? She's, oh, well, we try, but um, no one really comes up to the mountains, so... Worried by this, Dave tries to just ignore it. He says, well, maybe it's a, a local legend, a ghost story that you to tell. And that's what he tells himself. He goes back to his lodge and again tries to write, but nothing comes to him. He, again, hours staring at the typewriter. Eventually, through frustration, again, he tries to sleep. But then he's, again, in the night, awoken. This time not by banging, but by a strange chuckle. A childish, um, almost wistful sort of chuckle. He looks around and sees no nothing in his room. Afraid to go near the door, he instead looks out his window first to see if he can notice anything outside. Again, nothing at first, but the chuckling, it does seem to be coming from outside. So he watches and he waits because it eventually starts to get closer and closer, gets louder and louder. He eventually realizes that he recognizes this joyous laughter. He just never thought he would get to meet the person behind it. It's his creation, Henry the Hump, the happy little hippo. That's his laugh. He's surprised by this and expects to see Again, maybe through delirium or for his 
some odd manic state to see Henry out in the woods. But that's not what he sees. Instead, he sees a horrific amalgamation of Henry and Dave's publicist. It cackles again. Now, instead of a chuckle, but a cackle, it calls to him. Dave. You should join us in the dark, Dave. It's so quiet. It's so peaceful. Dave shakes his head, of course. He tries to hide again. But this time, the banging on the door returns. But this time with Henry's voice, Dave, join us, Dave. It's easier here. No more worries, no more suffering, just peace. He tries to cover his ears. He tries to wish it away. He tries everything he can, but Henry the Hump does just not want to leave. Dave crawls under his covers and tries to just, he becomes a child again, trying to hide from the boogeyman under the bed. He just tries to hide, but the door, though locked, seems to creak open ever so slowly. And the patter of and, and thud of human and hippo seems to make its way towards him. It doesn't, it gets to the foot of the bed and stops. Dave starts crying out to leave him alone. That it, He doesn't need this. He wants to be back to normal. He wants to be able to write again. But it doesn't leave. For a moment, it tries to tug at the covers. Tries to pull at it so he can see it properly, so he can see it in the light. But he holds strong. Dave does not want to see whatever this beast looks like, what it truly is. So he holds tight. That eventually gives up and leaves him. Dave, unable to sleep that night, tries to stay awake for as long as he can. Huddled in the covers, huddled at warmth, huddled in light, and huddled away from the fear and whatever is out there. Eventually the sun rises, and again, Dave tries to speak to Miss Cartwright, but can't seem to find her anywhere. He realizes as well that maybe staying here is a bad idea. So he tries to get to the gas station because he knows that's where the only phone is, an old rotary payphone. Supposedly it still works. He just runs down the street, past the houses and past the general store that all seem eerily still he looks at his watch thinking that's not right there should be people up this is a small sleepy town everyone would be awake at this time it's seven the fear starts to build again he start, his heart starts to palpitate he runs as quickly as he can to the gas station tries to get to the phone he finds it no attendee at the station doesn't matter puts in a quarter, tries to dial his publicist to ask to come pick him up. But at first it's dial tone. Dave tries again and again to see if it's anything. He then realizes that the phone line had been cut. He's just about to put the phone down when again he hears that voice from the night before. He hears Henry Say, Dave, just relax, Dave. Join us in the dark. Dave shakes it, shakes it off. He throws the phone's receiver down and 
he just starts to run. He just runs deep into the woods. He forgets everything. He forgets his typewriter. He forgets his clothes. He forgets he actually drove himself here. Doesn't matter. He just he just needs to get away. He just needs to get out. But he keeps running and running. And eventually he realizes that the forest is almost infinite. The road doesn't stop. It doesn't go anywhere. He looks back and sees that the town of Miner's Creek hasn't moved from the step that he has taken. It is still right behind him. He realizes that he's trapped here. As this realization hits, he looks out and notices that the darkness that tried to get him the first night has returned. This time, it is everywhere. It's not just outside his cabin. It is now everything. It is enveloping everything around him. Nothing exists but Dave in the darkness. He gets on his knees and just begs for this all to stop. Again, he hears Henry call out, it can stop, Dave, if you embrace it. Dave looks around, nothing left, nowhere to run, nowhere to hide. Just the inky black. He lets out a deep sob and a sigh and says yes. The darkness envelops him and he disappears. And you were worried. Freak me. Yeah, like... Mm -hmm. hey. I'm going to tell you, no, I wrote practically none of that. That's <laughs> even <upset>. worse! <laughs> you asshole! <laughs> I had some, like, I, I, I'm so sorry for not having anything written, but I had some of that written down, and then the rest of it just, yeah. Just Results went. are what matter. And right now, my heart is beating ridiculously <laughs> fast. I'm feeling slightly lightheaded, and I'm not sure how I'm going to sleep tonight. I'm Back just to upset the two that, of you assholes. <laughs> I'm just upset that nobody pet the bear. <laughs> it's a stuffed bear. Why would you touch it? Go ahead. To be fair, I, uh, the. <laughs> The, the amalgamation thing was going to be a few more things, but I just... Uh, I but yeah, no, that was amazing! Like, Dave of the Darkness is going to be a great band name one day. <laughs> I, I mean, it's probably a punk band name. I always have a joke of, like, things... Oh, yeah, no, that was my punk band in high school. Like, Consensual Cannibalism. Yeah, that was my punk band name in high school. <laughs> Yeah. When you started, <laughs> yeah, I it, I was like, oh, yeah, yeah uh, the horror story of it. We all know Writer's Block. And I was like, yeah, Writer's Block is definitely the horror story we are all intimately familiar yeah. with. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Nope. Nope. The real horror story was none of that going into the void. It was the. You have Writer's Block. Yeah. I mean, uh, how did you make Henry the Hump scary? I. I mean, to be fair, right? I, I've, I've, I've told my friends this. I actually genuinely find. Like cute children's things like horrifying like if you take something as simple as like a children's rhyme and have like just like a shadowy figure standing at the end of a hallway as that plays it instantly becomes 10 times more horrifying and that's always mm -hmm. the first image that comes to my mind so it's like oh yeah these things are terrifying with the right context yeah so it's like, just like any children's story ever can be terrifying you also have slowed down any children's rhyme, as you said. Either slow it down yeah. or put a shadowy figure there. Instantly yeah, like, so, <laughs> so that's what I was, so I was like, to be fair, the, the children's thing was just uh, a thought that I had. It wasn't anything to, like, I didn't even really think about that as I was writing that part. So it was just. Yes, that was amazing. Like. Uh, I don't. Uh... <laughs> You've both rendered me completely speechless. I swear I'm actually eloquent. I should be hosting this properly, but yes, I... you should, James. Come on. <laughs> I, I uh, just... uh, James, this is the real horror story. 
Yeah, you uh, I look like a fool on webcam now. Thanks. <laughs> we oh. all do. Like, <laughs> I, my nose started running like crazy because I was getting emotional during mine. I was like, shit, they can see me. My nose running all over the but place. To be fair, your your like being emotional is what sort of really sold it. Like, cause it like, you know, it almost had that thing of like you. Because you lived there, you you sort of know you know you you lived the story probably a lot, because it was like your close history, so like you could feel it, and that's what sort of made it better, I think. Mm -hmm. Well, um, as someone in uh, one of the the, the the terrible party stream Discord uh, pointed out, I'm a LARPer as well. I NPC mm. LARPs. So yeah, so you've got that experience of like being the thing. <laughs> That you need to be. Mm -hmm. I do what we call the 3 a.m. Eldritch mods. You want to know why they're called 3 a.m. Eldritch mods? I assume it's something to do with the time you stop. <laughs> we start them at 3 a.m. and they most likely involve Eldritch. An excellent combination. <laughs> yeah. You could do more of stuff like that. I always yeah. recommend anyone trying LARPing once, because if you can survive feeling like it's the end of the world for the weekend, you can do anything. Yeah, it's something I definitely want to do once all of this malarkey is over. Mm, the real horror story. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, thank you very much, everybody, for joining us. I'm just about getting my words back now. You've been fantastic company, both in chat and you two yourselves. My God, what a treat it's been, full stop. And while we are doing the streams, because we love doing the streams, you've got to remember that behind all this one, especially this one, is for a very good cause. If possible, if you could please head over to tinyurl.com forward slash terribleparty-opt20, which is a mouthful to say, but you get the general idea. <laughs> um, and you could donate to the Centre of Suicide Awareness. If you can't donate, that's also totally fine. I mean, it's a crazy period of time we're all living through at the minute not everybody's got money to spare even for such a good cause uh, but if you could at least consider telling about uh, your friends about the stream sharing us on socials just making a bit of noise about this excellent course and once again thank you to our two amazing guest storytellers on the stream you have been absolutely astronically good i mean you've left between us all you've left all of us who are, we do this not for a living, uh, maybe sometimes for a living, but we do this for a love it. And we would say we're fairly good at making words and speaking, and we've all been rendered speechless during all of this. So take that as a sign of quality of how good your damn stories have been. And uh, if there's anything you want to plug outside of a stream, you know, any Twitters, Tumblrs, links, whatever, take this time to do so now. Hi, I've been storytelling the bloody pit. My name is Michelle C. Light. The C stands for Crystal. <laughs> That's the real horror story. My full legal name is Michelle Crystal Light. Oh, um, so cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, I am later on tonight at eight o'clock Eastern Standard Time. I am I am the storyteller of Boston by Night, a Vampire the Masquerade V Five Chronicle set in modern day Boston, over on the Onyx Paths Twitch channel. We're having a special guest on for this episode, Miss Melee Damage, who is a actress, musician, all-around amazing human being. Um, I am also playing the role of Iris in uh, Deep Magic, which airs on Fridays on Twitch at Archives of the Dragon. And um, I'm also on Twitter at Michelle C. Light. I write stuff. I do things. That's how that goes. <laughs> Oh, right. Uh, I don't have, well, I have a Twitter at nonstop, uh, it's nonstop GM, right? I don't use it very often, and to be fair, you won't see much of any anything of what I did today on there. <laughs> Surprising. Damn. <laughs> I know, I, I really think I should do more s stories, but um, other than that, yeah, you can find me here at Terrible Party doing uh, Pathfinder, playing Helena, the human sorceress, uh, I'll more than likely be doing other things in the future on my own stream stuff. Uh, I do have a project that I've been desperately trying to get off the ground to kind of on and off this last year and this year that we will try and get done this year, which is a 
radio play about a goblin who owns a haberdashery store. We have what a concept! <laughs> oh, we, we had so much fun when we came up with this whole concept, and we are gonna when we can finally get down to recording it. It is gonna be a blast, and I hope people will love it. Greg is one of my favorite characters I've written in all my years, so. Very nice. Fantastic. Well, as I say, I'm at JL Wilson Writing on the Twitters and on all of the socials. Uh, my website is jlwilsonwriting.co.uk. I'm currently working on a rework of my previous books because I've been writing for years now and I released everything as I wrote them. I've got like five self-published books right now, which are great, wonderful, but I can't read the first few for sheer embarrassment of what my old projects were, which is a feeling all writers have, but sadly mine's on the internet and available to buy. So I'm currently working on trying to get those ship shape. Um, as I say, I've got some more stuff hopefully coming up with Terrible Party in the future. But yeah, we shall see. Don't forget everybody to come back at 1pm EST to see the Midday Mischief with Nate on here. Stay spooky, stay safe, love one each other, and I'll see you all on the flip side. Any last words from a voice behind the curtain, Ali? I think you uh, you covered it. We're uh, very excited to have more games today, more games tomorrow. Um, thank you, everyone who's tuned in. Chat like went off during this, so I think we need to do it again. Oh, don't Sometime. say that to me. <laughs> yes, we need to do it again, just for funsies. No pressure. Everyone says thanks for the stories. I was sitting was here no like for this one. freaking out, going, "Oh my god." I now I'm going to have nightmares, which is that's fine. Um, so we're we're super excited for everything this weekend. Thank you, everyone who volunteered your time, and your energy, and your resources, and keeping my butt in in check just because I run like a chicken with my head cut off through these things. So um, thank you all so very very much. And yeah, we'll see you in just under two hours for some amnesia streaming and me. Uh, losing my shit. So, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I may actually watch this one. Heck I, yeah! It'll be fun. It'll be fun. We're gonna be ridiculous. So we'll see you all in a little bit. Take care and uh, be safe and be well. Little bit.